people have always admired the beauty and delicate sheen on the wings of moths, such as this silk moth. In fact, this seemingly smooth surface is formed by the alignment of millions of tiny scales, overlapping like the tiles on a roof. Silk moths get their name not from their silken wings, but from the substance used to make cocoons in which they shelter as they change from caterpillar to moth. All moths start life as an industrious eating machine, a caterpillar. This is the larva of the Chinese silk moth, slightly speeded up. They eat fast, but not this fast. The caterpillars get through a vast amount of vegetation during their growth period, stripping the leaves to such an extent that they can do serious damage to the tree. The result is a cocoon, spun from a light, strong fibre which is unique in the animal world, silk. Left to itself, the cocoon will produce an adult moth, the breeding form of the animal, which is able to fly to find a mate. That's why these large wings are so important to the wild moth. But some cocoons aren't left to themselves. Silk has such special properties that in China, over 4,000 years ago, people bred a form of domestic silk moth with a huge caterpillar which was able to spin an enormous cocoon. The animal was bred specifically to produce silk in quantities and in a form which humans could use. Each cocoon is made of a single strand of silk almost a mile long. The adults, when they emerge, reveal puny wings quite unsuited to flight. The domestic silk moth cannot exist in the wild. It's totally dependent on mankind for its survival. Silk is no longer produced commercially in Britain, but there is one silk farm left near Sherborne in Dorset, which is kept open to show people how silk used to be made here. The exhibit at Lullingstone Silk Farm shows the traditional way of supporting the cocoons on sheaves of straw. Just a few selected cocoons are allowed to develop until the adults emerge for mating. The feather-like antennae of the male silk moth are sensitive to the scent put out by mature females. All female moths use the same kind of airborne hormones called pheromones to lure males to fly towards them to mate. But domestic silk moths are quite incapable of flight, so the moths must be only a short crawl apart if they're to have any chance of breeding. Mating occurs in the unromantic confines of a cardboard box, often in some enthusiast's airing cupboard. The silk farm sells eggs to people who want to try their hand at rearing their own silk moths. Scientists have studied the breeding behaviour of these ungainly moths to discover valuable information about the breeding of moths in general. They have found that the pheromone which the female releases into the air only attracts males of the same species. After mating, each female lays about 400 eggs, so tiny that you get over 60,000 of them to the ounce. The eggs are enormously valuable in the many far eastern countries where silk is still produced commercially. It was only when the great merchant caravans made the long journey to China that silk was first brought to the West. Despite the development of artificial fibres, the demand for real silk is still as great.
Fertile eggs turn grey just after they're laid. In northern climates, they may then have to be kept in cold storage until the mulberry trees begin to produce leaves. Once warmed up again to about 25 degrees centigrade, they'll hatch after 14 days. The first stage larva is tiny. The egg itself is hardly bigger than a full stop in a newspaper. All the eggs in one batch will hatch within a few hours of each other and the baby caterpillars will be ravenous for food. At Lullingstone, some of the caterpillars are fed in public on mulberry leaves, finely shredded at first. In England, mulberry trees are usually grown for their delicious red fruits but mulberry leaves are the only food plant that will keep the caterpillars growing. In an emergency, they have been kept alive for a few hours on dandelion leaves, comfrey, or even lettuce. The caterpillars eat the leaves in prodigious quantities during the 24 days they spend growing big enough to begin spinning their cocoons. In Japan, where silkworms are reared on a commercial scale by whole villages working cooperatively, each silk farm is surrounded by dense groves of mulberry trees lopped so that they grow as bushes. The silk farmers harvest their mulberry bushes in rotation, leaving them to grow new suckers round the base of the stem. It's a full-time job, even so early in the season. Later on, the farms may even have to buy in mulberry leaves as demand begins to outstrip the supply. On this farm, they're rearing over 220,000 silkworms hatched from just under four ounces of eggs supplied to the cooperative by a specialist silkworm breeder. For the three weeks or more that the worms need feeding, Rearing them will be a full-time job for two families with outside help as well. It's all very efficiently organized, but then it should be. The Japanese have been rearing silkworms for over 2,000 years. The rearing shed is like a small factory, a production line for a moth which was designed in China over 4,000 years ago. At first, the worms feed on leaves stripped off the mulberry bushes. Later, they will feed from twigs covered in leaves. And before they're finished, the workers will bring in whole branches to lay over the caterpillars, leaving them to do the stripping themselves. The pace hots up every day to keep the growing caterpillars supplied with food. Half the art of successful silkworm growing is in organizing the mulberry groves so that they produce enough leaves at the right time when the worms are eating really fast. As they grow, the worms have to be moved to larger quarters upstairs. This family raises five broods of silkworms each autumn. The move upstairs is necessary to make room for more tiny caterpillars coming into the trays on the floor below. <laughs> the growing silkworms eat faster and faster as the end of their life as caterpillars draws near. In the last three days before they reach maturity, they eat twice as much as they did in the whole of the previous three weeks since they hatched. The business of rearing them becomes a race between the mulberry cutters and the mulberry eaters. Each silkworm is now 12,000 times heavier than when it hatched out. Its weight has increased to nearly five grams in just over three weeks. 
but then the domestic silkworm was bred for fast growth and dedicated eating habits. Over 220 pounds of mulberry leaves will be consumed for every pound of raw silk that the farm will produce. The caterpillar eats methodically, taking the leaf a strip at a time, eating the stems and the ribs as well as the leaf blades. Everything is consumed except the woody twigs themselves. Time-lapse photography shows the awe-inspiring efficiency of the silkworms at work. This is a couple of hours eating, condensed into a few seconds. The next stage of their lives, spinning the cocoon, is the real reason for their somewhat unreal existence. All moths use silk to spin their protective cocoons. This puss moth caterpillar produces silk from glands in its head and while the silk is still sticky, scrapings of bark adhere to it. This may have started by chance when the moth first evolved, but now it is essential to the concealment of the cocoon. The pupa must lie still throughout the winter, unseen by hungry birds. A wild silkworm, like this one, spins an effective but rather disorganized cocoon using its silk to stick a pair of leaves together to make a shelter in which it can develop into an adult moth. It produces a cocoon of tangled silk, which it would be impossible to unwind without breaking. This is why wild silk moths are useless for commercial silk production. The domestic silkworms in their cardboard box are also nearing the time when they will spin silk. They become sluggish when they've had enough to eat. Then they begin to look waxy. That's the sign that they're about to begin spinning. Slowly at first, but with increasing efficiency as the hours go by. Liquid silk is produced from two glands in the caterpillar's head. It hardens on contact with the air. Each filament is coated in a sticky gum called sericin so that it attaches itself lightly but firmly to those beside it. The first spinning is fluffy and tangled as the caterpillar establishes an anchorage for the cocoon. In European silk farms, straw or heather are the traditional materials offered to give the silkworms somewhere to fasten the cocoons. But they will manage with the sides of a cardboard box if that's all there is. It just takes them a bit longer to attach the first anchorage. Spinning the whole cocoon takes three days on average, but some worms are quicker starters than others. While some of them have already begun the rotation, which enables them to spin the smooth inner cocoon, others are still grappling with the problem of anchoring themselves. The caterpillar lays the silk against the wall of the outer cocoon by moving its head from side to side in a figure of eight. As the cocoon walls get thicker, the caterpillar is hardly visible inside. To complete the cocoon, it has to rotate once every three or four seconds. That's a total of over 75,000 times in three days. When the spinning is done and the caterpillars have stopped moving, the corner of the shoebox looks like a deserted cellar in a horror film, all cobwebs and mysterious shapes. What the silk grower wants is the inner cocoon stripped of its fluffy outer anchor strands 
which he calls floss. In Japan, silkworms are encouraged to produce cocoons of regular shape and size in the smallest possible space. First, the worms are weighed to make sure that the right number is put into each spinning frame. The frames are mounted in rotating racks which can be hung up from the ceiling. This is for a special and highly ingenious reason. The silkworms climb upwards instinctively to look for an anchoring place for their cocoons, a piece of behaviour left over from the distant days when their ancestors were living wild in the forest. If they were allowed to clump together in one corner of the frame, there would be a risk that two caterpillars might spin their cocoons together with the strands of silk interwoven. Such double cocoons are worthless for the silk industry because it's impossible to unwind them. That's why the frames are mounted in rotating containers. If too many caterpillars get near the top, the container turns over and some of them have to start climbing again. When each worm has found a cubicle of its own, the spinning starts. The transparency of the silken strand is what makes it such a marvellous raw material for the art of weavers and dyers. Here's a whole rack of silkworms spinning their cocoons, greatly speeded up. Three days later, the racks are full of finished cocoons, each cocoon containing over a mile of pure transparent filament. In this room, there are 200,000 cocoons. That's enough silk to go round the world eight times. All the farmer has to do now is to remove the cocoons from the racks and clean off the floss to produce his crop. The cocoons are sold on the open market or sometimes directly to a silk factory which commissioned the farmer's work. He scrutinizes each frame before the cocoons are removed to pick out any doubles or otherwise malformed specimens. To see what happens next, we can come back to England to Lullingstone Silk Farm in Dorset. There they maintain the only surviving reeling machine in Britain to demonstrate how the cocoons are unwound. First, they're brushed in boiling water. The boiling kills the pupa inside the cocoon. The brushing pulls free the last layers of floss and releases the end of the single filament that forms the bulk of the cocoon. Of course, a few selected cocoons are left to develop to provide next season's eggs. By pulling the floss away gently, skilled hands can find the end of the filament and attach it to the reeling machine. Silk is the only natural fibre to be produced in a continuous thread, so this reeling process is unique. The silk filament is so fine that an ounce would circle the earth five times. The cocoons are kept in hot water all the time to help unstick the gum that held them together. Each thread is made up from the filaments of eight cocoons fused together. Despite its delicate appearance, the silk thread produced is extremely strong and elastic. The operator's job is to make sure that the cocoons are replaced as they begin to run out and to watch for breaks in the threads. The individual filaments are drawn up into a funnel-shaped device, but they're not twisted. A silk thread stays together rather as the cocoon did, 
because of the slight natural gumminess of the filaments. They're pressed together at a point called the croisure, or crossing, which wrings out a lot of the water. Many of the terms associated with the silk industry in Britain come from France, where the European silk industry began. The threads are wound up on creels, big collapsible wooden spools. The cocoon, which took the caterpillar three days to spin, is unwound in just five minutes. When the cocoon is completely unwound, all that's left is the remains of the pupa inside. This one will never become a moth. At Lallingstone, the dead pupae are collected and used to feed the peacocks that live in the garden. Some of the cocoons are allowed to develop naturally so that the emerging moths can breed to start a new generation of silkworms. The changes that take place inside the pupa are still something of a mystery, but the end product is an adult insect which somehow has to escape from the tough cocoon which it has spun for itself a month or so beforehand. Emerging from the pupil case is easy enough. The moth escapes from the cocoon by producing an enzyme which softens the silk until it can push through into the outside world. You can see the enzyme as a drop of fluid by the moth's mouth. A cocoon from which the moth has emerged is said to be pierced. As you can imagine, piercing breaks the continuous filament of silk and makes the cocoon impossible to reel. Worthless, in fact. Silk farmers select the cocoons which they will allow to develop for their quality to ensure that the next generation will be up to standard. The origins of the silk moth have long been forgotten. There is another mulberry-eating moth in China and Japan, but it has camouflage caterpillars and brown adults which can fly. Nobody knows for certain, but it might have been the ancestor of today's white domestic insects. The results of 4,000 years of selective breeding have been twofold. One of the most beautiful fibers known to man, and an animal which is totally incapable of surviving without human assistance. The silk moth will never be in danger of extinction for as long as people appreciate the warm and supple beauty of the fiber which it produces a natural fiber from a man-made moth that can never be duplicated even by the most advanced man-made materials. New on Monday, Animal Calypso looks at wildlife in the Caribbean, North Atlantic,